Welcome back to CTV News. Non-traditional risk factors combined to predict Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia. Those are some of the findings of a new study released today. Dr. Kenneth Rockwood and his colleagues at the Geriatric Medicine Research Unit at Dalhousie University published the report. And Dr. Rockwood joins us now. Thanks for coming in. A very fascinating day in your field of studies. Good to see you. Big day. Thanks very much. Uh, before we get to the study and some of the findings, uh, just some basic background stuff. A lot of people confuse the two. The differences between Alzheimer's and dementia are what? Sure. Dementia is the health problem in which people's memory and thinking uh, is so severely affected that it interferes with how they live their daily lives. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia after that strokes. And typically in our country, in North America, who are the people that are usually impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia? Mostly people over the age of 65, actually mostly people over the age of 80. So it's a disorder which is very uncommon under the age of 65, but affects between one and two and one in three people over the age of 85. And where are we now in Canada? On the rise? Is it uh, definitely manageable? on the rise. It's a, it, there, it's a big, big problem because the population is aging and the prevalence of dementia is going up in lockstep with the aging of the population. All right, so let's get to the study, non-traditional factors. I, I, explain that, flush that out if you will. Well, what, the, what does that mean? So for a long time, uh, it was thought that Alzheimer's was a neurodegenerative disorder and there was nothing in particular that gave rise to it. And then over the years, people started to look at that again. So we've always known that age is an important risk factor. And then it turned out that low education was an important risk factor. And then it turned out that having a family history in which there was Down syndrome was a risk factor. In the 1990s, we spent a lot of time understanding that vascular risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, things like that, were risks not just for stroke, but they were risk for Alzheimer's themselves. And then over time, the number of things that are individually shown to be a risk for Alzheimer's has grown. My colleagues and I were really interested in that and we said, you know, the list is getting to be so big right now, is that these illnesses in themselves are giving rise to a specific problem or is the problem more not with the risk factors but how in people who have genetic predisposition or who have whatever other problem it is, the brain is actually fighting back in a way that does more harm than good. So we said, what if we push this? What if we take things which are not known in any way to be risks for Alzheimer's, but are somehow not good for you, even if it's a low level of things, things like sinusitis or mm -hmm. fallen arches or, or uh, wearing dentures. Stuff you would never think of, Stuff obviously. Stuff you would never think of. And when we looked at them one at a time, they were not risks for Alzheimer's. But if you start to add up all these little tiny things, this turned out to be actually a powerful risk for mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. So the point is not that dentures are bad for you. The point is that things that accumulate, which individually may be bad for you and not necessarily bad for the brain, things will accumulate to become a risk for Alzheimer's. So when you take this information that you've gathered, these conclusions you've reached, and you, you take it out for a spin right. and you apply it to the science, what difference can it make down the road? Do you know yet? Can you, is there an application at work here you can take this and make changes uh, in, in the world uh, around us? So I think there's a couple of things. I think from, from, from the, the, the message we want the general public to understand is maintaining good health is not just good, it doesn't just give you good health, but it lowers the risk okay. of late life dementia. That's the thing for people to understand. The, when people ask, how should I best do that? It's clear that physical exercise is, is the way that you have accumulation of small good things and they add up to dramatically lower the risk for Alzheimer's. This is flipping on the other side. This mm -hmm. says that an accumulation of small bad things will increase the risk. I think really that message is more for the scientific community and it's drawing our attention to the fact that because the risk factors have virtually nothing in common, maybe we should pay less attention to that and more attention to how the brain repairs itself. And it may be that what the cause of Alzheimer's disease is, is not these risks, but it, it's a faulty repair mechanism. It's a repair mechanism that in some people mm -hmm. does more harm than good. So from the scientific community, we're trying to get out two messages. One is pay attention to the nature of the aberrant repair response, and the other one is pay attention to how small things add up. Tell me about the, the sample and the time frame of the study. How many people, how long? So this was a mountain of work. Actually, what we did was we reanalyzed all of the data on risk factors from the Canadian Study of Health and Aging. That study was carried out between 1991 and 2001, and the data were analyzed for about five years afterwards. So this was a comprehensive rethink 
of that database. That database has been very influential in the world. And I was very proud to be part of that study in which we looked at things like high blood pressure and cholesterol and, and those mm -hmm. sorts of things as risks. And they helped to establish the current understanding. So it was worthwhile for me to go back to that database, which had been so informative, and say, what if we started over? What if we started afresh? And what if we threw out everything that we think we know now and took these things which in themselves can't plausibly individually be related to the risk of Alzheimer's. So we use that as a, as a strategy to draw attention, not to these risk factors, mm -hmm. but to the fact that there must be something else going on, which is this aberrant repair response, or at least that's what we hypothesize. You know uh, you're onto something big when you do a ton of media, and you were telling me today you've been talking to reporters all day long, New York Times, before you came into today. New York Times, CNN, USA Today, it's been a, a huge response. Well, there's a language to that where I'm coming from. What does that tell you, that the world is so anxious to buy into your study this quickly and get this information out there? It must be heartening for you to have so many people engaged, interested in what your findings show us. Yes, yeah, the biggest media day for me. I think it's showing us two things. Number one is I think there's an appetite for people to understand that that good general health is good for you in the long term as well. I think there's been a fair amount of interest from the scientific community though in the idea that this is a new way to think about Alzheimer's. This is focusing us on the repair process, not the insult. If we can find the study, of, is, it, is it an online study? Is it in the magazine? If someone wants to go see it, read more about it, how can they do that? So it's in the journal Neurology, and it will be uh, online as of 4 o'clock today. Fantastic. It's a fascinating find, a fascinating subject, and one, of course, that touches so many Canadians, so many Maritimers, and so many people in North America. Kenneth Rockwood, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for the support. Well, it's good to have you in here. And CTV News continues after this.